care. Um, I am a treatment placement specialist for, so for all of you who do not know what Acadia Healthcare is, we're the largest behavioral healthcare company in the world with over 240 plus facilities in both the United States and Puerto Rico. Um, so my specific role within Acadia is I'm our treatment placement specialist located in Pennsylvania. I cover just about everything minus Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but as a treatment placement specialist, um, I'm essentially a complementary resource to help guide you, assist and support you and your clients and their families through the process of finding the right treatment program. Um, if you work with individuals experiencing a, a number of issues that can be captured under the umbrella of behavioral health, including substance abuse, um, anxiety, depression, trauma, eating disorders, co-occurring dual diagnosis, chronic pain, um, PTSD, um, who may require or desire a residential level of care. Um, I can be a resource to you. I take a patient first approach to find the best program that really meets the client's needs, taking into consideration single or multiple diagnoses, specialty programming, location, insurance, and out-of-pocket costs. Um, but I know, so you guys aren't here to hear my business pitch today. We're really here to hear Dr. Schwerer. So one of the most incredible facilities that I get to represent is called Sierra Tucson. Um, Sierra Tucson offers detox and residential for those who are ages 18 and older, um, especially with those struggling with mental health, substance abuse. We can also treat those uh, with co-occurring. We have specialty tracks, including trauma, pain management, um, those that are military personnel and for our first responders. So outside of the equine therapy, acupuncture and all the incredible insular activities we offer, it's truly our incredible staff that's boots on the ground and our clinicians that make our program so special. Um, so with all that being said, I'm going to introduce Dr. Schwer. If you guys have any questions, please throw it in the chat box um, and we will go through everything at the end. So thank you so much, everyone, once again, for taking your time out of your day to um, join us. Okay, I'm oh. online. So um, thanks for spending some time with us this morning. I am Dr. Maureen Schwer. I am a naturopathic doctor at Sierra Tucson. I am actually the director of our integrative services program here. So I have a staff of over 20 people who do acupuncture, massage, craniosacral therapy, zero balancing. We offer a lot of different services here because our approach is that we're trying to treat the whole person. So um, as a naturopathic doctor, I get the chance to share some topics. And today I'm going to talk to you guys about hormones and their relationship to mental health, addiction, um, trying to put the whole picture together. Sorry, my computer is usually slow for the first slide or two, and then it decides it's all right. There we go. Here we are. So naturopathic doctors are a medical specialty. We are a different kind of doctor. We um, are, there are six schools in the US and two in Canada that have four-year medical degrees in naturopathic medicine. And this map is giving you a sense of the licensure across the country for that. I, it's my understanding you guys are in Pennsylvania and I was able to take a look at that. Um, Pennsylvania, naturopathic medicine, we, naturopathic doctors are, I believe, registered, which is not quite licensed. It looks like we can, in your state, perform physical exams, um, provide some advice, but I don't think we have any prescribing rights. We are licensed in some form in 26 um, states across the country. I am in Arizona right now. I, I chose Arizona in part because in this state, I'm a fully licensed medical provider. I can prescribe most medications. I can order labs. Um, it really gives me a full scope of practice. In Washington state where I was trained, we are considered primary care doctors and insurance is part of our coverage. It, every insurance policy in Washington state is required to have a naturopathic doctor as part of their team. So I'm gonna just turn this off for a second so I can focus on the slides. I'll be back with the questions and answers. 
So this slide just goes over the training of naturopathic doctors. Um, I really love what I do, but there's so much confusion out there as to what we do. There are a lot of people who call themselves holistic or integrative or homeopathic, and they do some of the things we do. I think what's unique about licensed naturopathic doctors is our training. So in our four years of medical school, all of the same anatomy biochemistry as MDs get. You can see kind of the overview here of the hours, et cetera. Um, so my training is sort of best of both worlds. A lot of focus on the basics, medications, physiology, diagnosing, and then when it comes to treatment options, we have a lot more focus on nutrition. We talk about herbs and supplements. And our focus is that the body's natural state is health. So I'm always trying to find the most natural way to get people back to that point. Um, I think by the end of this lecture, or this webinar, you're gonna have a much better idea of what I'm talking about and see how I look at, at things. So hormones, we're going to talk about hormones. So um, what are hormones? We are biochemical beings. We are bodies that are made up of a whole bunch of molecules. And I think we often kind of lose sight of that. So hormones are messengers. They're messengers in our body that send important signals that tell our body what to do. The thing with hormones is like the, the, the ratio of the hormones, the timing of the hormones, all of this is important. Too much of a hormone is, is going to be bad. Too little of a hormone will be really bad as well. And so we, we need things really to be in balance with this. Um, and that's why things like stress and insomnia and medications and mental health issues can really mess with these messengers. And what can happen is we, we end up with these feed forward loops that can make it difficult for us to, to be well or feel well. So today we're gonna um, briefly talk about these important hormones. Um, the adrenal hormones, our adrenal glands sit on top of our kidneys. They do many things for our body. Um, and one of them is that they produce a lot of really important hormones that have to do with mood, energy level. And they're also really important as stress hormones to, to keep us safe in times of danger. So we're gonna talk about sex hormones. We're gonna talk about the thyroid, vitamin, the, the role of vitamin D, melatonin, insulin, and a few more. So, I do a lecture that's kind of similar to this in Sierra Tucson here. We're a big residential facility. And one of the things I always want to do is help the people who come here understand how stress messes with them. And one of the things I always talk about is that part of the problem with human beings is that we are the descendants of ancestors that were really good at getting away from, from um, danger. So we have this amazing ability in our body that we are completely different biological machines when we feel safe and in a good place than we do when we feel stressed or in danger. So our bodies have this amazing ability to keep us safe. So what happens is, so we're going to imagine going back in time. So let's imagine going back in time and we have our ancestor, it's a cave girl. So she's outside the cave, she's having a great day, she's eating some cave berries, she's relaxed, she's digesting her food, everything's good. Then she hears a sound, Arr, and it's a cave bear. So the minute she hears that sound, everything physiologically changes for her, everything changes. So the first thing that happens is her digestion goes offline because we can't afford to digest food. It takes a lot of energy if we're trying to run away from something. So her digestion goes offline. Her blood is shunted from her digestive tract to her muscles. Her heart rate increases. Her breathing changes. Her hearing changes. Small muscles in her ear contract. And she is more focused in on um, high and low tones and doesn't nor listen, doesn't notice sort of normal voice tones very well because she is in danger. So all of these things happen. And then what happens is her choices are fight, flight, or freeze. So she's our ancestor. She was a great survivor. And so she is like fast, fleet of foot, and she takes off. So she takes off. She scrambles up some rocks. She gets into a cave. She's safe. 
now her body can go back into rest and digest, right? Her digestion comes back online. She cut herself earlier that morning. Oh, now she can heal that cut. Her hormones can come back online because she's in a safe place. The trouble is that our cave bear in modern world can be constant, right? It could be physical pain and discomfort. It could be financial woes. It could be toxic relationship. It could be a toxic job. It could be an addiction that we're trying to hide from everybody. It can be a general fear of a deadly virus that is floating anywhere that you might get. Could be worries about global warming. All these cave bears are present. And what happens for an awful lot of Americans is that we are in constant fight or flight in some version. And so I'm wanting to kind of help you guys understand how all of that impacts us and sort of specifically how it impacts us so we can know what to do about that. <clears throat> so um, our autonomic nervous system allows us to adapt to stress. This is just a little um, simplified overview. Inside of our brain, we have the hypothalamus and it's connected by a little stock to our pituitary gland. And that hypothalamic pituitary axis is very important. So if we have a tiger walk into the room, or if we think about a tiger, our brain may release the same chemicals. So once we release those chemicals, some of them impact the vagus nerve, some of them go through the hypothalamus, sends messages to the pituitary gland, and it tells the cord, um, the adrenal gland, this there's danger. So the adrenal gland will shoot out epi and norepi, which is adrenaline. They're fast acting, and it will also shoot out cortisol, which is another stress hormone. So other glands that are impacted by that, by the by the hypothalamus, is our ovaries, our testes, our thyroid gland. This gland is responsible for the release of thyroid hormone, and it also impacts growth hormone. So Dr. Wilson is a naturopathic doctor, and this book is now, it's decently old, but it's still, it's still very relevant to everything that's going on. So adrenal fatigue is something he coined, that phrase. So if you go to your primary care doctor, even an endocrinologist and say, I have adrenal fatigue, they might test you. They might do a 24 hour cortisol test to see if you have you know, any cortisol, but they're not gonna really be talking about this in the same way that I'm gonna be talking about it today. So um, usually when you go into a doctor and, they, and you're talking about adrenal problems, they're looking at like full out adrenal failure where your adrenal glands are just not creating anything. What I'm really talking about here is with adrenal fatigue is that our adrenal glands and our nervous system have a normal setting, which is to kind of shoot out stress hormones when things are tough and then to go back into a rest and digest phase. With chronic stress, what happens is there ends up being a shift in this that I'm gonna go through. And so adren when a naturopathic doctor talks about adrenal function, what we're really looking at is optimal function. You can have your adrenals functioning in a very non-optimal way, and it is not likely to kill you, right? It's not likely to end up in a hospital. What will happen is you may just feel awful. You may have insomnia, you may have anxiety, you may have um, fatigue, irritability, digestive issues, all sorts of things. And um, these all make people's lives very difficult. The, the typical patient who would come to see me when I was in private practice was a middle-aged, usually it was a woman who would come in um, and she was really good at taking care of everybody else. And it sort of run herself into the ground. She had anxiety, she had depression, maybe some digestive issues. She was really depleted. Um, and that's what we're talking about. Adrenal fatigue is, it's a pandemic in America. I, I would say that um, where I am, most of the residents, I'd say 98% of the residents come in with this. At this point, probably 95% of the staff have some version of this. It's been a tough couple of years. And so I'm wanting us to understand this better and see how it all plays out. So this, I love this little, Piece. I got this from um, Dr. Lamb's website. It's down there. You can go find it. You're 
result if you want to be able to read it better. This is such a nice visual. I love visuals to explain what I'm talking about. So across the bottom is, is time. And again, not to scale. And then across the top here, we're going to talk about maybe adrenal function, right? So at the very top where we're beginning, at the beginning of this graph, what you have is someone with really good adrenal function. So in um, a in the book, Adrenal Fatigue, Dr. Wilson talks about three stages of adrenal function. So the white area here at top represents stage one. So stage one is normal adrenal function. So the analogy would be if you're driving along in your car and a cat jumps in front of your car, in stage one, you, your adrenal glands shoot out some adrenaline. You kind of get this little burst of wide awakeness. You slam on the brakes. You miss the cat. Everything goes away. And then 10 minutes later, you're not even thinking about it, right? Your body easily goes into the stress response and back again. So the, the light gray area is stage two adrenal fatigue. In stage two adrenal fatigue, you're going to have symptoms. This is this, um, your adrenal system has been activated so much and it starts to overreact to things. So in stage two, one of the things that starts to happen is that we shoot out too much adrenaline or cortisol to smaller situations. So when I went to medical school, it was in Seattle and I'm not a great swimmer. And there's, there's some really long bridges in Seattle. So when I first started medical school, when I drove over those bridges, I'd get that kind of sweet little adrenaline feeling like almost what you get on a Ferris wheel, like, oh, that's a lot of water. By after a year or two, I had worn myself out because of my perfectionism, and I started to have full-out panic attacks when I would go over the bridges. I started to, um, like, I remember one night I was almost asleep, I was really tired, and I remembered something small, like, oh, I forgot to give Michelle that book I promised her, and boom, my body shot out so much adrenaline that I felt like, you know, someone had just threatened me. And so what happens in stage two is that your adrenal glands start to shoot out too much adrenaline. So the analogy here is you're driving along in your car, a cat jumps in front of your car, you shoot out the adrenaline, you're wide awake, but maybe you're still awake three or four hours later. Maybe if you're driving home, you can't sleep for a couple of hours because your body has overreacted to a simple stressor. So that's what happens in stage two. Stage two is where we get the anxiety, the insomnia, the digestive issues, the um, immune dysfunction, all the things we're going to talk about. So in the gray, the darker gray area in the bottom, that's stage three. And in stage three, what happens is the adrenal glands sort of lose their ability to adapt. So in stage three, the, the um, analogy you might be you're driving home and the cat jumps in front of your car and you you don't even stop, right? And no cats were actually harmed in this example. So in stage three, you kind of fall over this cliff. And in this cliff, you start to get the chronic fatigue, the fibromyalgia, all the things that really take people down and make it really difficult for them to function. So I know that there's more going on with that. There's lots of different ways to look at it, but Looking from a homeroom perspective, this is what we would see. So I'm going to give you an, um, I'm going to go through this graph with an, an example of a patient I had. When I was in private practice, I had this woman that came to see me and she came to see me. She was solidly in the stage two. But if we go back, I always do the, the history when I'm talking to people. And so we go back and we start this. So she was a very successful jeweler, right? She and her husband had this jewelry store. She made beautiful jewelry. They were in a location they'd been in for a long time and they were doing good. So this is kind of that. So that's like she used to live up there, right? So she might have kind of a stressful day. Maybe she had to really stay late to do this and she'd go down a little bit in the dip. But then the next day, she'd be able to go back up again. So she had this kind of peace, but she was getting busier and she was getting more successful. Then what happened is they decided we're doing so well, we're going to move into this really nice mall. So she moved into La Encantada in Tucson, which is a beautiful mall. And right after she moved into the expensive, beautiful mall, the economy just tanked. That was a big tank. So 
what happened is as soon as she did that, people stopped coming in, right? And so then she starts to take some bigger dips. So to get by, one of the things that they did is they um, let go most of their staff. And so her staff was her husband. <laughs> it was just her and her husband. And her husband wanted to be a husband, not really a staff member. And so he met well, but he was, it just wasn't, it wasn't a good situation. She was working probably good 11 or 12 hour days. So what started happening is she started to kind of dip down into this gray area. So she started having insomnia. She had some mild anxiety. Um, she started having more PMS symptoms. We're gonna talk about that. Her digestion was a little off when she came to see me. So we're gonna say she's in that six or seven kind of place. So I worked with her. I I put her on bioidentical hormones. We did a hormone test. I put her on a lot of adrenal support. Um, I did a lot of things to prop her up. And I'm gonna say that most of the time she was seeing me, what we were seeing was this kind of eight, right? So we were using a lot of things to prop this up, but she still had a lot of stress. And so she was sort of just barely floating. She felt better. And honestly, she would dip down into the symptoms sometime. Well, so that was okay until her, they found out that her son who had been in college um, wasn't doing so well. And so he dropped out of school and he came back and then they really found out that, oh, what was really going on is that he had a pretty serious addiction that they were not aware of. And now he's back in their home with all of the stressors that go on to there. And at that point between the store and that all of the King's horses and all the King's men and all of the things that I could do for her weren't really enough. And she started to really slide into this feeling worse and worse and worse. So she would, you know, have the anxiety was there, the, all of these things. So the, the moral of this story is the inconvenient truth is we are human. We are human. And I think so many of us in our culture are, ta are taught to power through, are taught to put everyone else ahead of ourselves. If we have, you know, addiction in our background, if we have codependency, there's all these reasons. But what can happen is then you can really end up kind of sliding down. I'll often have patients where I am, they're in this kind of static, that eight, where I'm keeping them going and they're just barely getting by. And often it'll be a situation like they're taking care of their mother who has Alzheimer's and things like that. One of the things will often happen is when the stressor goes away, when they quit shooting out adrenaline, they're living off of adrenaline. What you'll often see is when things finally get better, they'll fall off that cliff. And what they'll often do is develop things like autoimmune conditions and things like that, because they really are down in that gray area pretty deeply, but they're living off of adrenaline and they know how to do that. So this is kind of a really nice visual to understand what can happen to us. Um, we had talked about this, adrenal fatigue is not a diagnosis. It's a, it's a way of looking at how chronic stress can cause hormonal dysregulation and how that can affect so many other things going on in our body. So we had talked about this um, some before. We're gonna talk a little bit more soon about the, the hormone piece. Um, what people often feel is fatigue, immune problems, insomnia, there'll be di blood sugar dysregulation. Um, what'll happen is the body will have too much cortisol at the wrong times and that impacts insulin. So when you have high cortisol, it activates insulin and it leads to more insulin dysregulation. Um, so stress really does impact weight gain. Also the increased fat cells increase aromatase. Fat cells in, inside of our fat cells, we have a enzyme called aromatase. And what it does is create estrogen. So we end up creating estrogen. And I'm gonna talk in a little bit about why that has a big impact. Um, it also, we're going to talk about this, you can cause depletion of some other important hormones that can mess with all of our reproductive hormones. So we talked about this um, symptoms that you might think, oh, maybe this person has some adrenal fatigue. Chronic sore throat is something I see quite often in people. They'll talk about, they'll have this like sore throat that kind of doesn't go away. They don't really feel, they don't get really sick, but they don't feel well. 
um, they'll get sick more often, or maybe when they get sick, it'll stay a lot longer. There can be some more irritability. People will often crave salt or sweets. There can be, um, and this has to do with the aldosterone in the adrenal glands. There can be sort of excess thirst and there also can be this going to the bathroom all the time. People will talk about mental fog. It can include depression, um, anxiety, headaches, weakness, Muscle pain can be associated with this, um, brain fog, decreased memory, palpitations, lightheadedness, all of these are things that when someone talks about this, I, I always um, pay attention to their adrenal function. So this is a great slide to be able to, to look at what's going on. So cortisol that we release when we're stressed is also a really important hormone to help in our wake sleep cycle. So what should happen is we have this sort of on the first one, diurnal cortisol. What should happen is right before you wake up in the morning, your cortis your adrenal glands should shoot out cortisol. The, that level should be highest in the morning and it helps you to wake up, feel refreshed, feel focused. It's an important, you need that on board, right? So you want it to be nice and high in the morning and then throughout the day, it should slowly go down and at night it should be low. And then what happens is in the evening, melatonin starts to go up, which helps you sleep. So what happens with chronic stress, you see in this, sec this second slide, so the dark black line here is showing us um, someone with some adrenal fatigue. So the black line shows you want them to be somewhere between those in that gray area, but what happens in the morning is cortisol is too low. And I have seen people down where we'll test it in the morning and it'll be zero or two. So in the morning, your cortisol should be low. And then what should happen, sorry, when in the morning, when your cortisol is low, you just don't feel well, right? You just don't have enough energy. And so what we, what do we normally reach for? Caffeine. We reach for caffeine because caffeine forces our adrenal glands to create norepinephrine, which is an adrenaline. And it also, nor, norepi also has some mood impacts. So we're too low in the morning. We're kind of groggy. We aren't feeling good. This person is just crashing around noon. They just have no energy. And then irritatingly, this is a really common sign. In the evening, people start to feel better. So what people will say, I'll say, how's your energy? Oh, it's not good. So let's be specific. How is it in the morning you wake up? Oh, it's hard for me to wake up. It, you know, I'm just kind of groggy. I don't know. I feel better once I get some coffee in me. All right. So after that, what happens? Well, I kind of dragged through stuff, but it seems like right around noon, I just crashed and it can barely get up. And so I kind of dragged through the day. What about the evening? You know, in the evening, I feel a little better. They start to feel better in the evening. We end up with this opposite pattern where it goes up in the evening. And then in this person, it even goes up more when it, they're supposed to be sleeping. So what happens with this is insomnia. So this is a nice little slide to look at this. The cortisol is a black line. So this is daylight, like a, before nine o'clock. So the, what should happen is this, right? Your cortisol is high in the in the daytime, and then it slowly goes down, and then the melatonin should go up at night, and then it should go down. This is a healthy, a healthy pattern. What will happen with this is the cortisol will often shift. It'll be low in the morning, and then it'll kind of go up at night so that you get this insomnia piece. So this is just one more awesome way to look at this. Um, they're looking at cortisol levels and how it, um, how it changes with stress. So what you wanna be is in that green area. You want the cortisol levels to be in this sweet spot between the, um, in that green area, which is homeostasis. Within that, you can have a little adrenal release because something's stressful, but then you kind of go back in it and you're all normal with like, a, with um, chronic stress, what happens is you kind of go into this big yellow area, right? Which should be how we do it for acute distress. We kind of go up into this area, but what happens is for a while we get stuck in that yellow. We overreact to things. We have too much adrenaline. As time goes on, it goes into this orange, attempted adaptation. The body says, this is too much. I, this is just not working. And things, you just sort of run out of that. And then you start to have this low cortisol levels. 
And this is where people will feel that really intense fatigue and then it can really drop into this collapse state. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about exactly why chronic stress can mess with hormones. So this is our hormone cascade. This cascade um, happens in our adrenal glands. It also happens in women in their ovaries and in men in their testicles. So um, what is below, it starts with pregnenolone up in the upper left-hand corner. What comes before that is actually cholesterol. So pregnenolone is a molecule that we make and then pregnenolone can go, goes two different ways. In one direction, it goes over to DHEA and that creates endestradione. Um, and then that creates either, it creates both estrogen and testosterone. And those can even go back and forth. So those are the, the androgens. In the other direction, pregnenolone goes to progesterone. So all of this would be fine and good and wouldn't be impacted by stress so much, except for this. Cortisol, that really important hormone that we've been talking about, cortisol that you, you create when you're under stress, cortisol that we need to be able to feel like we have good energy and focus, all of it comes from progesterone. So what happens is if we are under chronic stress, everything will go to cortisol because our bodies are designed to save you from the bear. So we are designed to keep us alive because that makes the most sense for everyone's safety. And this also means that when we're under chronic stress, our sex hormones are gonna be off because it really makes no sense to be reproducing when we're under chronic stress. The chances of us being successful are much less. So this impacts women more quickly than it impacts men. And that is because we cycle every month. So what happens is every month, a woman creates all of these hormones, right? So every month, a woman creates all the hormones that she needs to have a baby. And then if there's no fertilization, she gets rid of all that and we start over again every single month. It really seems a little excessive to me that every month we go through all of this. So what happens with women is the first half of our menstrual cycle is high in estrogen. And then about day 15, the estrogen starts to go down and progesterone comes up. So progesterone um, starts to come up into, and then what happens is around day 19 to 21, it should be highest. And if there's no fertilized egg, the progesterone drops. And at that point, the woman will, will have her menstrual cycle. So when that happens, if there is not enough progesterone around, so when she gets to that point, she'll have symptoms of low progesterone. So these are symptoms of low progesterone, headaches or migraines, irritability, anxiety, depression, low libido, irregular menstrual cycles, weight gain, insomnia, food cravings, it's PMS. So PMS symptoms are almost always because of low progesterone. So what happens is when we're under stress, the body will turn all the progesterone into cortisol because it's trying to save you from that bear, right? And when it does and you don't have enough, you can have all these PMS symptoms. So what I see is that women will often say, you know, oh, when they're younger, they might say, well, I felt kind of off maybe the day before. And then as they get older, they might have more severe symptoms for longer. And if they're still under chronic stress and they're in this kind of adrenal um, fatigue place that the PMS can become really severe. I have talked to women who have told me I am suicidal every month, but it's always only right before my period. I have talked to women who will say I have three or four good days a month and then I start to get PMS. They can get very depleted. So for men, they get away with it a little longer just because they're not making so much hormones. But over time, this, the all of this will pull back to cortisol and they can end up being low in testosterone and DHEA. So what I've seen, and there's other things that play into this, I know that, but what I've seen is that men are getting, are being impacted by this and, and experiencing low testosterone earlier and earlier. Other things that are playing into this is there are more hormones in our world right now. So many women are on birth control pills that it's literally in our water supply. Also plastics, when we use put um, water in plastic bottles, when we eat things that are wrapped in plastics, 
the plasticides, the things that make plastic really like flexible is that molecule is estrogenic, meaning when we get it in our body, our, it looks enough like estrogen that it can impact us. And so that can mess with hormones as well. But the big story here is that when we have chronic stress, it really messes with hormones and then that can start mess with, mess with mood even further. So low progesterone is the number one I'm going to go back to that for a second. Low progesterone is the number one hormonal problem I see in people. The thing that I see really impacting their mood most often. I see this so often, um, the insomnia piece, all of that. Some of it gets so much better when people are treated for progesterone. So low estrogen really only impacts women usually it, and after menopause or if they've had a hysterectomy or if they're on like tamoxifen or something for breast cancer. So with low estrogen, the big thing you get is hot flashes. That's the first symptom that really affects people. It can contribute to depression and brain fog. Um, a big thing also with this is bone loss and then also thinning of the hair and skin. Low testosterone in men and women can cause fatigue, low sex drive, lower muscle mass, slower healing. And it has been linked to anxiety and depression, but more often in men than women. So allopregnanolone. Um, so when we have progesterone in the body, our body breaks down progesterone. And one of its breakdown products is this metabolite allopregnanolone. And so it turns out that this molecule is really important because it impacts the GABA receptor. And I didn't add this slide. I was just doing another continuing education. So it actually hits the GABA receptor in two places. So GABA is the most calming of our neurotransmitters, right? It's where like gabapentin, the drug form affects the GABA receptors. Benzos are active here. We use a lot of kind of hardcore drugs to affect this receptor because it helps to lower anxiety and make people feel better. But it turns out that naturally, when we have progesterone, as we break it down, it creates this beautiful molecule that bathes our GABA receptors and it activates them in a way that helps to lower anxiety. So it is also neuroprotective. So it's an important neuroprotective if there's inflammatory things going on in the brain. One of the most common places that I see that now is COVID. COVID often creates neuroinflammation and progesterone can be really protective of that. It is an anti-anxiolytic and an antidepressant. Um, reduced levels of allopregnanolone are found to be associated with major depression, anxiety disorders, PM, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and Alzheimer's. So this is a study, um, just looking at some ways that they have studied this. So they took some cocaine dependent women and they, they tested their circulating progesterone. And then what they did is they exposed them to a drug Q. So something that reminded them of cocaine use, right? So it could have been a picture of cocaine, could have been paraphernalia. So what they found is that the women had high, that had higher progesterone levels, when they did that, they didn't get the big kind of spike in blood pressure. They also reported lower levels of anxiety and lower drug, drug cravings. So the women with naturally higher progesterone um, were not as activated by that cue. So here they started to try to really break this down a bit to see um, how this might be activating things. So first they gave um, some of these subjects progesterone. And what they found is that when they gave them bioidentical progesterone, it actually really increased their allopregnanolone levels. So this is really important. Um, the fake progesterone, progestin, which is a drug version, which is in most of the progesterone containing birth control is a completely different molecule. Progestin, fake progesterone is poorly tolerated by women. It is associated with blood clots and increased risk of stroke and heart disease. And it also does not help mood at all. It is not what you need. What you need is bioidentical progesterone. 
And that can either come in the form of being prescribed that, or it could be in the form of helping to reduce stress and have a person come into a healthy state. So they're not constantly turning their progesterone into cortisol. Um, they found that the subjects with higher allopregnenolone levels had more normalized um, stress responses. Um, they found that when they gave progesterone in, in both men and women and their allopregnenolone increase, that there was improvements in their stress response in both men and women. Um, the most of these studies at this time, at least, were more around cocaine. They used it in looking at people who had cocaine use disorder because there's nothing like cocaine to mess with your adrenals. Um, but they, there have been some similar studies looking at some of these others. So testosterone. Um, women are more than twice as likely as men to suffer from mood disorders. Um, some of this is really true. I think some of it is that men don't tell us about mood disorders. I think that that statement has some caveats for sure. Um, so prior to the onset of menstruation, levels of depression and anxiety are relatively equal between men and boys. And I see this a lot. I'll often talk to people. I always ask them their whole story and I'll say, when did this start? And so often women will say, oh, it started with menstruation. I remember things started to get worse when I was 13. I remember things started to get worse when I you know, was 12 or 14. Often I'll see that anxiety increases and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, men who have hypogonadism, so they have um, low testosterone, they are more likely to suffer from mood disorders. Um, and if they are treated with hormones, their mood often increases. So men who have low testosterone, who are treated with testosterone, often their mood improves. Most studies indicate that testosterone is a beneficial treatment for mood disorder in men, especially if they have low testosterone. Um, so interesting with this, topical has been shown to be more beneficial than injective forms for mood. So the form of hormones is really important in a lot of things. Um, I'm going to hopefully be able to get to talk that in a minute. Here we just talked about this um, synthetic progesterone, medroxy, progesterone acetate, the synthetic form. You can see here it's just a different molecule. What drug companies typically do is they take something natural like progesterone and then they throw things on it until they find something that still kind of acts like the original molecule but um, is different. So they actually like try to figure out, okay, which of these modifications seems to work best and is least harmful, which makes no sense to me because we have a perfectly good molecule that works really well, that doesn't have the side effects. They do this of course, because they cannot patent natural things. So they can't patent progesterone. So they change it so that they can turn it into a drug but that almost always has some, some impacts. So one of the interesting things about stress is that it's sort of addictive. Stress, there's this piece when we're stressed that getting a little more stressed in the short term feels better. So we have this dual stress response, meaning um, we have a fast and a slow response. So the fast response, so if something stressful happens, the fast response is that we shoot out adrenaline, um, epi and norepi, right? And so this causes this kind of burst of energy, this increased flow to the muscles, heart rate. It, it, it's, it's like caffeine, right? Caffeine does this. Caffeine works completely on that side of, the, of this. So if we're tired, if we aren't feeling well, when we do this, we feel better. That's why when we're really down, we use stimulants, right? So when we use stimulants, we temporarily feel better. So the other side, the yellow side is the slow response. So when we're stressed, also we get the slower response, meaning that our body releases cortisol and that cortisol starts to mess with our immune system. It, it um, causes inflammation. It messes with, with the healing of our, it, it messes with our immune system and, and healing. It messes with a lot of stuff. The trouble is that if we're under chronic stress and we feel bad, we will often seek out things that give us this fast stimulation because for a little bit, we feel better. 
So that might be coffee. It might be starting a fight with someone because we're so tired and then we do that and we feel better for a little bit. It might be taking on new things, right? That we overburden ourselves or we might be addicted to drama, whatever it is, but there is this kind of response because of this fast and slow response, the fast response makes us feel better. And sometimes it makes us choose things that in the minute we feel a little better, but then long-term we don't. One of the hardest things I found when I was working with um, patients long-term when I had a, um, a private practice is I'd work with them for months. We'd finally get to a better place. Maybe they were off the cliff in that stage three. They'd start feeling better. They'd start to be able to function and almost always they'd come in and say, how you doing? And they'd say, oh, I was doing okay, but now I just feel awful again. And so like, what happened? And they'll say something like, well, I felt so good. And it was the weekend and I've been feeling so guilty because I haven't been taking my house. So I decided to clean my entire house or I felt bad about this. So I took on this huge project or I felt like I finally felt better. So I got a second job to make up with the money that I feel worried about because I was sick for so long. They just overstress themselves. They don't let themselves go into that um, mode to actually heal. And when they first start doing that, they feel good. It reminds them of their old self, right? And they use that fast response, but then it just, it takes them down again. So what do we do about this? Um, from a naturopathic perspective, when someone has adrenal fatigue, um, there's a couple of ways I approach it. So more specifically, I try to support the adrenals. And so in the herbal world, world, almost every biome across the world has these adaptogens. So they are herbs that help us deal with stress. Holy basil, um, ashwagandha, eleutherococcus, ginseng, rhodiola. Rhodiola is the adaptogen of the Vikings. It grows in Northern Europe. It's super strong. <laughs> so it's the herbal I won't give to someone who's really depleted because it could cause anxiety. Um, so we have these herbs and what they do is they help support the adrenal, the adrenal gland to heal, but they also mildly bind to the cortisol receptors. So what that means is if you have something really stressful happen and you're shooting out too much cortisol, it blocks the receptors so that you don't get so anxious. It lowers the stress response. And if you're in a state where you're really depleted and your cortisol is too low, it's stimulating them mildly so that you get more energy. So it actually helps on both ends and it's just there for you. So I'll often do some herbal adaptogens. There's a lot of you know, combinations here, we probably have, you know, three or four of them on formulary. Um, I'll often in women, especially do B vitamins. B vitamins are very important and women eat up Bs when they're menstruating. So B, I'll often give them a good B vitamin. Vitamin C is really helpful. Pantothenic acid is very helpful and vitamin D and I'll, I'll test vitamin D levels. Vitamin D is important for mood um, and especially if people live in the northern areas or if they're inside all day, they're often depleted in that. All test hormones in men, you can test them anytime. I will test as total estrogens, DHEA, and then free and total testosterone. In women, if they're menstruating, I have to test them in day 19 to 21. I have to test them when the progesterone should be highest because almost always that's, that's the problem. If they are postmenopause, you can test them anytime. If they're on birth control pill, it gets a lot more complex. Um, I so I'm looking at hor the hormones treating them directly. I am looking at the adrenals. I always look at relaxing things at night. When someone has insomnia, I'm treating both ends of the day. So in the morning, I support the adrenals and energy, and then at night, I'm doing calming, relaxing things to help lower that cortisol and to help support melatonin. Um, if there's anxiety on board, these are some really lovely things that I often use. Um, L-theanine helps to calm and focus the mind. It is something that is okay, even if someone has bipolar disorder, you have to know bipolar is different. So L-theanine is fine with bipolar disorder and it can be used, it can be helpful because it actually helps to, it works on the right enzyme to calm that down. Glycine is a calming amino acid. It is wonderful. Um, it works pretty fast. It is 
not okay to do that with someone who you think has bipolar disorder because it could um, increase mania. Lavella is a concentrated lavender oil. Um, it's really good for anxiety. It's a wonderful supplement. Um, it takes several days to work. GABA, it turns out that our gut bacteria actually make GABA. And so giving GABA is something that is, it can be really helpful. And GABA Calm is probably the thing that I use most often, but there's lots of good supplements. Kava is an herb that is really good for a, adrenal support and for anxiety. Kava at high doses can be addictive. It can be abused. None of the other stuff can be abused, but kava can be abused. So I would not give kava to anyone who had any kind of addiction because I don't need to be creating a new fun thing. They're like, I felt good on it. So I started to take it in huge doses. So no need for that. Um, and the big piece really in working with people is I try really hard to do this like balance of life. They have to have a balance. Um, and this is a very poorly drawn analogy of this, but that little gray ball is like vitality, right? That's like a healthy immune system, a healthy digestive system, a healthy hormone system, someone who's just like filled with all the nutrients they need, they get enough sleep, they have all the hormones. And so then things, as you go down, you start getting drains. So if someone is starting to have symptoms all the things we talked about, you know, might be able to help pull them up, right? All the hormones and the adaptogens, et cetera. But I'm always looking at the pieces of what's draining them, right? And so I always have that, that talk with people of like, okay, what in your life is feeding you and what is draining you? So we all have only so much energy. Um, my favorite thing I usually bring up is um, Carolyn Mace was very popular for a while with self-help books a long time ago. But she has this thing called energy money. Every day you're born, you wake up in the morning with $100 of energy money and you get to decide where you're going to put it, right? And so you can decide to spend it all like tracking your ex on Instagram or like, you know, cyber stalking them, or you can invest it in going for a walk and get more energy. So we invest it and in and it's important that we invest enough of it in ourselves. So one of the things that Carolyn says that I love is that if someone is complaining to you, what they're saying is, I've used up all my energy money, can I have some of yours? And that is something that most people really can hear. If you have all the energy in the world and you wanna sit and listen to someone complain all day and you can do it, that's great. If you're barely getting by, you have to really decide where you put your energy money and you have to, you know, spend it wisely. All right, I'm gonna stop here so we can get, get some questions in. Let me see if I can get Sarah back online and me back online in our fancy. Here we are. Hello, everyone. So I do not see any questions in the chat box. Um, so if anyone wants to shout out a question or has any um comments anything like that feel free to send it in or raise your hand thank you dr schwery this was so interesting to me um it makes me one want to go get a doctor's appointment myself <laughs> um so this was really awesome thank you so much for taking your time to present this yeah, I, it's so nice. I, I miss, I get why it's so much easier for all of you to come on this way. And I'm glad you guys all did. It's amazing that we have like 41 per participants is beautiful. And I wish I could be there right with each of you to ask. So if any of you have any questions, put them in the chat because I'm happy. I have a few minutes to answer them. So anyone who doesn't have any questions or concerns, um, you can pop off at any time and I will be following up with an email regarding everything. Um, that was discussed today, um, along with my info and Dr. Schwerer's, if you had any additional questions for her as well. Um, you should be expecting an email me, from me, hopefully by the end of the week, just depending on when I get the list. And so as, let's see, Ann Crothers asked, interested in stress as addictive. I've seen many people who seek stress and drama avoid peace. Yeah. And I mean, I think some of that is, you know, family of origin and my family complaining about everybody was like our 
I don't know, like our shared hobby <laughs> that I had to really learn not to do. But yeah, it's funny how there's that addictive piece that really has us do that. And I've noticed for myself, I will often do that. If I'm down, I have to watch that what I don't do is just take on more because I feel better for a minute and then, but I can't really afford it. I don't have the energy money. Um, so how would you recommend individuals um, to start the process of finding a practitioner? Very good question. I'm curious myself on this one. Yeah, so I quickly jumped online this morning. So there is a Pennsylvania Naturopathic Association and they have a find a doc tab. And you know, what's really nice now is with, um, so all of the people on that will be people who are licensed. They might not have, a, even if they're not licensed in Pennsylvania, if they're only registered, they usually have a license in another licensed state. And um, a lot of people now are doing the webinars and things so that you have that chance to be able to still meet with someone. So I would start there with the Pennsylvania Naturopathic Association and then just um, look at the website, see who seems like a good fit. And almost all naturopathic doctors will let you do a short visit to see if it's a good fit for you. Thank you. Yep. And the next one, um, is any of this related to PCOS? and helpful in managing it or any advice on managing it? No, no, no. Yes. So with PCOS, um, you know, what happens is that there's too much, there's, they're almost always low progesterone and then too much testosterone. The, there'll be this dysregulation and it's, it appears to be really closely re um, related to blood sugar dysregulation. There's a really close link there that I'm not sure science is completely caught up with. So with someone that has PCOS, I always test their hormones, almost always they're low in progesterone. So there's someone who often really benefits from progesterone. And then I, I look really closely at the blood glucose regulation. And um, so I'm paying attention to that, having them often kind of, you know, doing a diet that's more healthy and making sure that they're maintaining that. But yeah, the low progesterone is often the big piece where I'll see the, you know, increased anxiety, insomnia. It's like PCOS is everything I said kind of times two, and it is very treatable. There's a lot that can be done if it's looked at from a natural perspective, for sure. What about kind of tying in then the correlation between this? And then is there anything that correlates with like schizophrenia? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I have not as, as closely really looked at exactly what's going on once we get to the schizophrenia link. And I mean, part of that honestly is um, I work in a mental health facility where we will occasionally get people who have schizophrenia as a primary diagnosis, but it's not, we just so much more often have anxiety, depression, PTSD, bipolar disorder. Um, and so it goes into this whole other realm and there are naturopathic doctors who have that expertise, but I don't want to say things that could be misleading. No, thank you so much. Um, it's such an interesting topic in general. And I'm thank you guys, by the way, for sending in all these questions. They're questions I have myself. So um, the next one is, so what would be your go-to supplement to start clients off with who um, you believe are struggling with adrenal issues? Yeah. So the trouble I have with the go-to thing is that what I really do is I take a full history. I talk about everything. And then based on that, I go to, you know, I, I start, I, I tailor it. It really does make a difference. It isn't like, oh, someone can't sleep. I give them this. It's someone can't sleep. And then I ask, okay, do they have a hard time getting to sleep or staying asleep? You know, when they wake up, are they anxious or are they just sort of like really like calm, but still can't sleep? Like there's all these details. In general, if you're trying to just, you know, throw something at someone, then going on the more um, gentle edge is a good option. So I would say um, like ashwagandha or eleutherococcus are really gentle adaptogens that almost anybody can handle. And it'll be able to be a good start with that. Um, 
I also think if there's a lot of anxiety and rumination, L-theanine is safe for almost everybody. And it's a really nice place to have them start to be able to start you know, supporting that. I wish I had really easy answers for this, but that's not really how I practice. Um, and I think you don't get as good results with that. I love that perspective of having a more of an individualistic like treatment plan. Um, and that's just kind of Sierra Tucson, I feel like in general, where we really want to focus on like everyone's specific needs. Um, so the next question we have is, um, in what way does menopause affect progesterone levels? I, I can't speak today, but <laughs> yeah. So with menopause, what happens with our hormones is, you know, the first half of our menstrual cycle is high in estrogen. The second half is progesterone. So if someone went into menopause in that like white, totally healthy state, right? What will happen then is as they go into menopause, their estrogen and progesterone will both kind of drop together. And those people usually do okay. The problem is that most women in America go into menopause where their progesterone is already too low. And it's too low because they've been under stress right? So they run themselves, they do too much, they don't have a balanced life. Remember, a balanced life is eight hours of work, eight hours of play, and eight hours of sleep. And almost no one gets that. So you go I was going to say, like lucky this. you if you do that. <laughs> right. So the problem is you go in like this. And so then when you go into menopause and everything drops, then those women end up having more symptoms, more insomnia, more problems like that. And so that's really why it, it matters so much. So um, that's why in menopause, you can often get that increase in all of the anxiety, depression, those sorts of things. And then once the estrogen goes down, they'll get the hot flashes in that piece. And then over time, they'll start to get like, you know, the bone density, those sorts of things. But usually the things that really bug them, women in menopause are the hot flashes, but, you know, also the, the sort of anxiety, insomnia pieces that come in. So the next question is, what about melatonin for insomnia? So kind of a perfect tie-in. Um, does that affect someone's daytime schedule? And then just a question I have to tack along with melatonin is, you know, is that good or bad to help insomnia and sleep? I feel like there's so much misinformation of this can be addictive and bad, or this is a good yeah. thing. So just your perspective on melatonin and insomnia. Yeah. So melatonin, I think melatonin can really safely be tried. Um, it does not always help. It's not my experience. And my experience in today's world is it often doesn't because although we're supporting that melatonin, you know, what we have is like the anxiety is high, everything else is kind of fighting it. And so seldom do I find I give someone melatonin and then they sleep well. It often helps them sleep more deeply and that can be helpful. Um, but it's not that piece. It can safely be tried. And that's one of those things, like if you're in a healthy range, melatonin is more likely to help. If you're in this chronic stress range, it's less likely to. It is not addictive. It doesn't ruin things. But if you regularly take melatonin and then you suddenly stop, you might not be able to sleep. So if you regularly oh, sleep, okay. you just have to slowly lower it and do it like you would anything else. And then your body will adjust because you will start to make your own. But especially if you take it above like, you know, two milligrams is not that big a deal. But once you get above that, it might be. But, you know, I haven't seen that be as much of a problem with people. I just, honestly, I think with COVID people are just really, really sick and they are really anxious and they are really tired and yeah. they're just, things are tough right now. And so, so many people have some pretty severe adrenal stress. And I just wanted you guys to get like, oh, this has big implications across everything. And that's why like what we do is so important, like helping people get a balanced life, having a look at it. But as Americans, we're not that good at taking things off our plate. Um, but sometimes when you explain why and have them understand the physiology, they get why it all ties together. So this kind of ties in then. So if someone is having, um, they have a client and essentially, you know, that client, they're having issues with their birth control. They're trying to explain it to the OBGYN, but she's really not understanding, you know, that tie and how it could be affecting her in other ways. Um, so what are your recommendations for like advocates, social workers, 
that, you know, want to advocate for their clients to get them a different birth control, but the doctors just aren't quite getting it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the best thing that I've really found is to like create relationships with doctors in your area that you know, think the way you do, you know, like I'll usually, usually my patients will get it. Most of the time when I saw patients in Arizona, we are fully licensed here, but insurance doesn't usually cover us. So people would have, they'd see me, but they'd also have a primary care doc. And sometimes I would just say, why don't you go to Dr. So-and-so? She's really good. Like, it's funny, like two of the women I used to refer to all the time in my private practice, like independently ended up working at Sierra Tucson. <laughs> so it's nice <laughs> to have those like-minded, but usually I, it's just with the busyness and sometimes people, sometimes doctors are really set in what they believe in others. My gynecologist is super open to stuff. She's really, a lot of people are, this isn't, this is science. I'm not just making it up, but you need to <laughs> actually is more open. A good way to find those people often is to call a local compounding pharmacy, call a compounding pharmacy because people who do hormones often use them and ask them who in my area treats PMS, who in my area treats whatever. And those people that you're going to get are more likely to be the practitioners that are going to understand what I'm talking about. And that's a, a tip I often give people. So what if someone doesn't have ovaries and therefore they can't do like hormone replacement therapy or anything, would milk be a suitable like estrogen replacement? Or if not, if you do have any recommendations for that? Did you just say milk? Yes. So yeah, so milk will not give you any estrogen. Oh, yeah, milk helps. Yep, sorry. Yep, it was milk. Milk has calcium. But um, if someone doesn't have their ovaries and they're young, right? So if someone loses their ovaries when they're, I would say below 50, they need to really talk to their doctor. Oh, soy milk, sorry. Huh? Soy milk, not just milk. Soy oh, milk. Soy milk. Okay. So um so if someone does has their ovaries removed before they are like 50, they need to talk to their doctor about hormone replacement because you need to be able to have the estrogen on board or what you end up with is um, really weak bones. And so the problem there is you don't want to end up being having osteoporosis at age 55. So, um, and if someone doesn't have a uterus and they're on hormones, it's really important that they're on progesterone and estrogen. A lot of doctors will just prescribe um, estrogen and think they don't have to. If, if, you have, if you have a uterus and you give someone estrogen without progesterone, there's a risk of cancer. So doctors don't do that. But if there's no uterus, they'll often give you estrogen, which will help with hot flashes, but it can, have, it can make mood things worse right? So if you're doing that and you feel great, that's fine. But if you're doing that and you have anxiety or insomnia or problems like that, then putting in progesterone, bioidentical progesterone, they'll almost always feel better. And so soy milk, soy is estrogenic, meaning it kind of looks like estrogen. So if you take enough of it, it'll activate the receptors. Um, it's it's usually not as big a deal as they say. I, I recommend, I don't think people need to avoid soy unless they've had an estrogen positive cancer. That's different. But um, in general, the way people have eaten soy for a long, long time has been fermented. This whole like, you know, like um, soy milk, things like that. So like tofu, tempeh, like fermented forms of soy are often much better for our body. I think that's how humans have eaten soy for so long until we decided we turned it into a processed food. Awesome. So what about any advice on how to adapt the treatment for children or teens? So, um, you know, I used to work with kids on the spectrum and meaning ADD to autism. Um, Autistic males tend to have too much testosterone early on. And so if there's especially signs like the little kid with a little bit of a mustache, like I'll, I would often test that. And then they will sometimes use spironolactone to suppress it because it can mess with things. 
Beyond that, I haven't done a lot of hormone stuff with children. In teens, um, I see the PMS piece coming up a lot in teens. And so teenagers, teens are teens are having a tough time right now. Um, <laughs> so doing some adrenal support, I would just go more gentle. So the the spectrum of support, if I think someone doesn't have enough progesterone, so the spectrum goes anywhere from we treat the adrenals and we help to support that. And then that takes off the burden and they, the hormones normalize. There are herbal supplements that help to do that. Like chase tree helps to balance it. So that's kind of a medium inner, you know, thing you can do. And then the big guns are the hormone replacement. And so we have this spectrum. Um, the younger someone is, the more vitality, it's easier to get a shift over here. Um, but if a, if a girl has some really bad hormones, often what they'll do is they'll throw them on birth control pills. And sometimes everything gets worse with that. And sometimes you have young women with some pretty severe mental health concerns. And that's where I would actually consider doing progesterone therapy. That's where I would call the compounding pharmacy locally and ask them who works with adolescent teens and does hormone therapy. They'll be able to tell you who might be able to do that. Awesome. So next one, if well, an individual- I'm so sorry, Sarah. I just have, I just have time for one more because we're kind of over. So if it's okay, if we do one more question and then I, I got to go. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much for all of your time. So let's see. Um, in general, okay. If an individual is on chemical hormones, such as birth control, how long after being off birth control, does the body regulate to natural hormones and does it ever return to baseline production of natural hormones? So um, I believe the body can always go back to baseline, but what you got to look what look at is all the other stressors in there, right? So again, it's like if you take that optimally healthy person with an easy lifestyle, that's like not a lot of stress, things are good. And then you have a on birth control for a little bit, you take it off, it'll just be a blip and it's no big deal. But if someone has a lot of depletion underneath it, and then you've been using that to suppress symptoms and underneath there's a lot of depletion, when you take them off, it's going to take a while for the body to come back. And so it's this bigger piece. Um, the one thing I didn't have time to get to today that I'm gonna mention, it's our last one, is um, I'm really a big believer in looking at that, the mutation for folate, the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, MTHFR mutation. It's really common out there. And that mutation affects an enzyme. And so that enzyme is, enzymes are like workers in the body. They either build things or they break them down. So that methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase is an enzyme and we eat folate, folate. So folate comes from foliage. So we eat some delicious greens and then we have all this folate floating around, but that's useless to humans. It has to go through this enzyme and it comes out a slightly different molecule. That molecule is so important. We need it to make hormones. We need it to make neurotransmitters. So people who have two copies of the most severe um, adaptation, which is not that rare, like I have it. If you have two copies, you have an increased risk for anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. Like, and it's almost everything because that molecule is important for almost everything. So I will often test it. We do genetic testing here that shows us it's part of the gene site testing. You can actually also, if someone doesn't do genetic testing here, I'll order it through LabCorp. You can, it's a, it's a blood test, but I always look for that. A clue for that is that girls will often say everything got worse when I started to menstruate. Because what happens is you kind of have enough and you're getting along, but then when you start to menstruate and you use all those hormones, all the folate up to do that, they don't have enough. And then you start getting symptoms. So they'll get anxiety, those sorts of things. A clue also is that you should test this is stuff will run in the family. Right. So you'll have like, I'll say, you know, tell me about your family, what's going on. And so you might see a lot of anxiety or depression. You might see um, ADD or autism. You might see a history of cancer. If they have a family history where a lot of people are having a lot going on, I always test for that. Um, Deplin is the drug that's a drug version of a vitamin. And then you can just get five methyl tetrahydrofolate. Active folate is readily available. 
at any supplement store, it actually all comes from the same place. <laughs> it's just packaged in different things. So um, it's an easy supplement and you can replace it. But looking at that piece is really a clue that I always look for like, oh, we need to look at this because that's a, it's a big thing that might mess with them. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much again for all of your time and wisdom and knowledge. Um, I need a doctor's appointment with you next. This has been so incredibly helpful. Um, and just thank you again to everyone that joined today. We will be following up with you by the end of the week. And I hope everyone has a great week. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for everyone for being part of it. I super appreciate it. I appreciate that there's still 21 people on. That's lovely. Have a beautiful day over thank there. You. And, um, thanks <laughs> Bye. so much. Bye-bye.